so welcome everyone. Um, this is lecture number one, module one, um, for our um, um, machine learning in bioinformatics. Um, these are the standard slides that we'll be showing at the beginning of each um, presentation, uh, just indicating that uh, we're using a uh, Creative Commons license for, for the data. And um, the schedule is already something that uh, Nia has highlighted. Um, I'll show this schedule um, each time we start a new module, just so people know where we are. And roughly, I can keep track of the time because it's um, some of these modules finish at odd times, like you know 12.15 or uh, start at 4.15 and 4.30. So that's sometimes a little confusing, uh, but you guys, again, can follow along with the slides you've already downloaded. Um, something this is we've had before about asking questions. You can use Slack, you can use Zoom. You can also interrupt um, if you want through the audio. Um, so this is something that's already been brought up. Um, likewise, if you need more attention or if the question is really long and elaborate or requires lots of um, TLC, then we'll try and do that through the, the, the breakout rooms. Um, so I think I'm just a little puzzled about, you know, I think I'm just gonna... change things a little bit here. So this is a uh, workshop we've given three times before. Uh, well, this is the third time. And one of the things I think it's important for people to understand right off the bat is that we need to temper our expectations about what you're gonna be doing. Um, this is a two day workshop. Um, it's not a, a two week or two month or a two year uh, program. Um, and machine learning is not something you can basically learn in two days, but the intention here is to give you some introduction and to maybe whet your appetite, but also to bring in, you into contact with people uh, particularly the TAs here, who can potentially help you uh, with some of your learning, machine learning problems. Um, and this is what we've done in the past. Um, a number of interesting collaborations have developed, people have learned a lot. Um, and, and likewise, to interact with some of the people um, that you've already been introduced to. Some of you have somewhat similar objectives, um, interests, and, and sometimes working with uh, fellow classmates might also be a, a way of working out some of your challenges. Um, so we're going to talk about machine learning here. This is a very gentle introduction of the first bit. We're going to go show some examples of machine learning, some of which you guys are probably well aware of, others maybe you didn't know about. Applications of machine learning in bioinformatics and genomics and, and proteomics and other areas. And then we're going to talk about the standard machine learning workflow. And this is where there's a lot of confusion. And sometimes people will think that machine learning can solve all problems or that it's the best choice to solve all problems. It, it isn't. Um, there are limitations. Um, there are excellent other methods that are far faster, far better than machine learning in certain circumstances. And sometimes understanding your problem and understanding a little bit about the solutions or the strengths and weaknesses of machine learning really helps. Uh, we're also gonna try and introduce you guys to CoLab, which hopefully most of you or all of you have done. If you haven't, we'll also take a little bit of time out during the break to help those of you who have had some challenges with CoLab or other parts and the code repository. Um, so, um, so as I said, one thing to do is uh, understand that machine learning is very powerful and it's used in many fields. We'll see some examples. Um, fundamentally, machine learning is, is difficult. Um, it has lots of subdisciplines where people have to be familiar with, um, if you want to really understand it, uh, at least second year calculus and differential and partial differential equations. Um, typically, you have to have advanced training in math. Um, the coding is also challenging because it is advanced math, and you need to have pretty advanced statistics to fully understand it. Now, I don't want to scare people because many of you may not have that background. And in fact, we're going to be showing you, um, I guess, two approaches to, to machine learning. Um, one is the, the hardcore math, uh, which is how back in the 80s and 90s, uh, when I was learning about machine learning, how you had to do it. But a lot of that's been simplified now. And, and so you don't necessarily have to master um, 
uh, math and computing science and statistics to use it. Um, but if you want to be an expert at it, you do. So there's a, there's a difference there. I mean, lots of people can learn how to drive, but not everyone can become a Formula One driver. Um, so uh, that said, two days won't make you guys an expert in machine learning. Uh, as I say, it's intended to whet your appetite to understand some of the um, challenges with it, uh, to look under the hood, uh, to appreciate some of the, the, the tough math, uh, but also to maybe better understand the math, and then to show you how to get around some of those math challenges so that you can, at least if you've got some good programming skills, probably use machine learning in, in your own work. Hopefully it'll inspire you to learn more on your own. And in fact, that's really the intent for a lot of these CBW workshops is to, to get you started. And if you're curious enough, it, it allows you to open other doors along your journey. Um, so most of, in fact, almost all the examples I'll be giving will be using Python and we'll be using the Google Collaboratory, uh, which hopefully most of you guys have um, um, been able to log into or create. We've tried to create our code for each of the modules. Um, not sure Mark is working on one of them. Mark, were you able to finish the last bit on the uh, artificial neural net for the gene finding? Yeah, I'm, I'm still working on the script. It probably will be done by tomorrow. Okay. Anyways, so these are for some of you who are you know fluent in R, who think in R, dream in R. Um, we've tried to also produce R. Uh, code for this. But the preferred language really for machine learning is actually Python these days. Um, all the code will be provided to you. Um, that way you don't have to install Python or a Python environment on your computer, which sometimes can be challenging. So the Colab is a web-based uh, system for programming. Okay, so that's a little bit of a background, tempering your expectations, framing what you could or should expect to be able to do, and also giving you the concept that we're going to show you, you know, the tough way to climb Everest. And then we're going to tell you how to take the helicopter up to Mount Everest. And we'll tell you how to take the helicopter up to Mount Everest tomorrow. But for today, we're going to show you um, how to climb Everest uh, the tough way. Um, so don't be intimidated. Um, but it is, I say, a way of understanding really what's under the hood with machine learning. So uh, we're talking about machine learning. Um, it's probably good to remember what learning is. So learning is something that we learn, we do. Um, dogs learn, um, nematodes can learn. Uh, anything that uh, is a process, often through repetition, uh, way which an organism or a system improves its performance through experience. So machine learning is actually a sub-discipline uh, or a branch of artificial intelligence or AI. And it's focused not on um, organisms, but it's on computers, uh, improving their performance through experience, experience that you've given to the computer or to your model. So machine learning essentially develops programs, or we call them models, uh, that can make predictions or decisions, classifying, partitioning, finding biomarkers, without being explicitly programmed to do so. Um, so that's a, a, an important caveat, an important distinction. Now, machine learning actually is really old. It's not much um, younger than the discovery or development of computers, which happened in the mid 40s. So machine learning was already being done in the 1950s. And Arthur Samuel is sort of considered the father of machine learning and basically, uh, he defined it as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being programmed. And he worked on uh, checkers solving. And interestingly, a uh, professor here at the University of Alberta um, extended Arthur Samuel's work and um, developed a, um, the world's best checkers program. And that largely launched um, the activities here at the University of Alberta for machine learning. Um, I think if you want to understand machine learning and distinguish it from traditional programming, this is, I think, a useful um, picture. So when we talk about traditional programming, uh, you're going to have a set of inputs. Uh, those inputs will be read by the program. It will manipulate those inputs and it will spit out an output. So it could be 
here's my list of um, genes and um, their association with um, some form of cancer and the output might be um, a statistical um, assessment of, of gene uh, propensity for causing cancer. So it might just calculate numbers, add things up, divide by the total number, something like that. So a mathematical uh, manipulation. In machine learning, what you're actually doing is not just giving an input, uh, but you're also giving the output to your, and it's not called a program, it's called a, a learner or a model. And what that learner or model does is actually spits out a program or a predictor or a model or an answer. Um, and that's, that's fundamentally different than what we think of, of general algorithms. So this is maybe better described with this picture. So we have programs to do addition and multiplication and division and uh, averaging and median calculation. Um, so we have something that does addition at the top, one plus one equals two. In machine learning, what we would do is we'd give it a lot of examples of addition. One plus zero is one, one plus one is two, one plus two is three. So these are giving both the input, one plus one or one plus zero, and the output, um, one, two, three, four. And by giving all of these examples, this large data set to the learner or the model, it actually comes up with a model for adding. So it learns to add. Um, now, it's kind of a silly example because computers are very good at adding and algorithmically, and it can be done through Boolean operations. So it, it would be dumb to write a, a machine learning program to do addition, but this is just a simple example, a toy example of how machine learning works. It's a lot of data where both the uh, input and the output are provided. If you don't know the answer, then, or if you don't have examples of the answer, then it's really hard to do machine learning. And so this is when some of you guys were describing your machine learning problems or things where you wanted to look at machine learning. Some of those things might have to be framed a little differently, or you have to think about how do I get a training set where I have you know, both the query and the answer. And if you've got that, then you can use machine learning. Here's an example where it's visual recognition. This is where traditional computer algorithms do really badly. So these are examples, four examples of the number two written by different people, um, some of whom I don't think know how to write. But um, and if you gave these examples of number two to a traditional computer program, it probably wouldn't know what you're doing. But if you've given these examples of what two looks like with different people writing it and then told it that all of these are different ways of writing the number two, then a machine learning model would be able to uh, essentially have a capacity to recognize the number two. It probably wouldn't be able to do anything else but this is an example of how you can do visual recognition. You could train it to recognize number threes and number ones and maybe more and more. And so this is how a lot of character recognition software actually works. The same software that's used to identify addresses on letters uh, from Canada Post or the US Postal Service. So if you're distinguishing it, then conventional computer programs perform very tedious tasks much faster and much more accurately than humans. So computer traditional programming is very good at addition, subtraction, multiplication, averaging. It's also good for things like spell checking because it can look up you know, every single word spelled correctly and compare to see if it's you know, a close match and then give you the corrected spelling. So that's a conventional program. Now, machine learning algorithms perform tasks that are difficult or infeasible through conventional algorithms. So spell checking is one thing. Grammar checking is totally different. Um, it's not something you can just kind of look up in a, a long list and say, does this match or does it not? Um, it's about style and you know, which words are best put together and past and present tense, um, putting things into plural or non-plural form. Interpreting speech, uh, taking a spoken word, which is you know an audio file with um, 
variations in frequencies and converting that into words. It's something that we do every day. Computer traditional programming just couldn't do that, hasn't been able to do that until machine learning came along. Image recognition, looking at all these different versions of number two, again, something that our eyes are good at, our brains are good at, but traditional programming fails at. Machine learning is very good at this. So if we're distinguishing between machine learning or ML and artificial intelligence AI, um, we have to remember that AI is older. Uh, it, it dates from the early 50s. And many people view machine learning as a subfield as of AI. Both still require lots of data, training data, examples data, uh, input and output. Um, some people say they're the same. Some people view them differently. There's no right answer. Traditionally, AI was developed on expert systems where people would write out long lists of rules or if then else or something like that. Look up tables, case for both checkers and chess. They had look up tables. They had certainly lots of data. In the case of checkers and chess, they had you know, thousands of games all loaded up. So the computer could look up things and say, ah, I see this, I've seen this pattern before, I should do the next thing. Um, so that's how they solve problems. And they take advantage of the fact that they have this you know, perfect memory and near infinite size, something that the human brain doesn't. Now, machine learning doesn't use expert systems. It doesn't use if then else, it doesn't use large lookup tables. It uses probabilistic computing. It uses statistics. It uses optimization techniques, um, gradient descent methods um, um, to, um, or maximum likelihood uh, expectation or maximize expectation methods to try and make predictions. So that's different. Um, ironically or interestingly, most of the people who are now working in the field of machine learning actually started in artificial intelligence. And, and so many will do both. Although I think there's more and more people moving into the machine learning field because of the spectacular successes it's had. So if you're trying to distinguish things between machine learning and AI, something like face recognition, um, whether it's you know, from CIA or CSIS recognizing your face, and um, it still has to be able to figure out where a person's eyes and nose and mouth are and how they are in different proportions, uh, or recognizing faces when the cell phone focuses on a face or faces. Uh, that's machine learning. Now, AI, uh, which was done, made its sort of um, heralded debut, if you want, when, when Deep Blue uh, beat Gary Kasparov in World Championship test, Chess. So this is done in 1997. This used artificial intelligence, but as I said, it used large libraries of many, many chess games and many um, scenarios that it you know, played on its own and played against itself. Um, to build this, this large uh, lookup table of what to do um, in a chess game. So uh, that's artificial intelligence. It's like having a perfect brain, a perfect recall, um, but it's, it's, I'd say, different than machine learning. Some of you might be old enough, uh, if you've watched Jeopardy, some of you also know Ken Jennings as the new host of uh, Jeopardy. This is when Ken Jennings was much younger. Um, he's um, a guy who was, is widely considered to be the, the best Jeopardy player ever, uh, one of the smartest people around. Um, and those who don't know Jeopardy, it's a game that's mostly about um, general knowledge. And you basically have to answer um, a statement with a question, but it's basically still a question answering skill test. Uh, Brad Rutter is considered the second best Jeopardy player of all time. And something called um, Watson, which is in the middle, um, is a computer program. And Watson was a development project by IBM that was to try and make something smarter than a human or smarter than the smartest human being. So Watson uh, was, made its debut in 2010. It took four years, more than a thousand people, and cost IBM almost a billion dollars. Um, 
to make this program. And after investing a billion dollars, it won a million dollars in Jeopardy in 2011. Um, and it's actually a very impressive tool because it used natural language processing, which was brand new at the time. So that's being able to understand English language or any language. It used information retrieval lookup, which is sort of an AI thing. It had uh, automated reasoning. Um, and it also used some machine learning. At the time, you had um, things like encyclopedias, Wikipedia was sort of online, dictionaries, thesauruses, newswire articles, DBpedia, which is part of the Wikipedia WordNet, Iago, all of these resources, which are online. And if someone you know, wanted to read them and spend you know, three years of the life reading it and totally memorizing it, it had that. But Watson, of course, had memorized all of this. Watson has been moved from you know, what used to be a very large computer. It's now on the cloud. It has capabilities to see, hear, read, talk, taste, interpret, learn, and recommend. Um, so it, it's, it was sort of the, the pinnacle, um, the K2, if you want, of, of machine learning in what we thought we could do and with AI. Um, but then uh, last year, uh, I guess the Everest appeared, and that's ChatGPT. Um, so this is a chat bot. Uh, chat bots have actually been around for a long, long time, but very simple minded ones. OpenAI released it November 30th, that's version 3.5. It cost almost as much as Watson, about 700 million. Uh, didn't take as many people as 350 people, but they still spent four years working on it. Um, it used much more sophisticated machine learning technology than what Watson had. So it used, the GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer Model. Transformer models are similar to uh, graphical neural nets, which are more advanced versions of um, um, artificial neural nets. ChatGPT is, is called, or a member of the Large Language Model, LLMs, and it used huge amounts of text, 45 terabytes. That translates to about 300 million ty typed pages or 500 billion words. Um, if you wanted to compare it, most of you have probably done texting. Most of you have autofill. Um, so you type in a word, the first two letters, and it guesses what the next one is or next word is. Um, that's kind of what ChatGPT does. It just, instead of trying to guess what the word is, it guesses the next 10 or the next 20 or the next 30 words based on what the previous first two or three words had been. And that's kind of how brain works, how brains, how we, how we speak. Um, the amazing thing about ChatGPT is that it seems to be smarter than Ken Jennings. It seems to be smarter than Watson. It has passed very difficult exams and done almost perfectly in the SATs, graduate record exams, legal LSATs, many other things. Um, so this is where uh, machine learning has taken us. This might be some of the reasons why some of you guys have signed in because um, what ChatGPT can do and what machine learning can do is quite astonishing right now. Uh, some of you have used ChatGPT, and maybe we'll ask for um, a, a poll. Well, you can just fill in on Slack or on the uh, chat box uh, with Zoom. How many of you guys have actually used ChatGPT? Um, just say yes, and we'll find out if there's 75% or 50% or 100% of you have done this. Um, anyways, uh, ChatGPT can be funny. Uh, it's made jokes, it can be used to help code uh, and write code. We'll see some examples. Uh, people have written some pretty impressive uh, cover letters and gotten jobs. Some people have been able to take on extra jobs pretending to be themselves when in fact the chat GPT is doing all the work. Uh, it can write poems, it can write lyrics for songs, uh, and a lot of them actually are very impressively good. Now, there's also another realm, and some of you guys have kind of mentioned this as well, machine learning versus data mining. Data mining uh, is trying to discover previously unknown knowledge from a large corpus of data or text. Um, machine learning is focused on either reproducing or predicting from known knowledge. So they are similar, they require lots of data, they both can be used to predict, but data mining is essentially allowing you to, to make new observations, new inferences. Now, ChatGPT appears to be capable of that. 
So in some level, ChatGPT can perform elements of data mining. And in fact, you can adapt it and we'll show you guys how to do or use ChatGPT to do data mining or information extraction. Now, the other thing that's been um, talked a lot about over the last few years is deep learning. This is something that ChatGPT does. Uh, it's something that most of the advanced tools in machine learning are able to do or employ. So deep learning is a discipline, a subdiscipline of machine learning. Deep learning uses uh, variations of artificial neural nets or ANNs. What they are is that the number of layers typically used in these ANNs is, is much greater. Uh, we call them hidden layers. And so instead of having one or two hidden layers, you have five, six, seven or more. Um, so the ANNs become deep neural nets. We have and a... Sure. A we question? have a hand up in the in the chat. Sure. I think that was. Oh, sorry. Before. I think I if that was me, I must have left it up from. Yeah, some of you. I think I just we wanted to find out how many people had actually used Chat GPT, and I don't know if anyone's been able to count either from the Slack or from the Zoom. Um, Eighteen yeses here, and I think one hand was up. So nineteen in total, I guess. So roughly half of you have used Chat GPT. Uh, which is good. Um, um, so I, I won't be sort of uh, completely um, reviewing something that everyone's been doing. So next, you know, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about what ChatGPT can do for you. Um, anyways, the point about deep neural nets is that they are, um, because they're more complicated and take much longer to train and uh, require often very specialized computers with uh, graphical processing units or multi-CPU sets. Um, they can learn more complicated patterns. They can handle tougher problems. They can make smarter predictions. They perform better. And so this has been critical to the large learning um, uh, language models with the LLMs. Now, within these deep neural nets, people call these things called recurrent neural nets, convolutional neural nets, graphical neural nets, deep belief nets. These are all examples of, of architectures for um, deep learning. And, and many of them are just in, inspired by what we've learned about the human brain, um, about how we learn, how we have short-term and long-term memory, how we forget. Uh, in fact, forgetting can be important for learning. Um, and, and how we reinforce what we learn. Uh, if we're trying to say a new word, we might say it three or four times to practice. Um, a lot of those ideas are implemented into these more advanced deep neural nets. So this is where biology has actually inspired a lot of what um, is used in machine learning. The key players, the people who started the field of deep learning are two Canadians, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who's at the University of Toronto, and Yasha Benjo, who's at the University of Montreal. Um, Hinton's originally from, from Scotland, um, but moved to Toronto, I think in the late 80s. He's won the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize um, for, for mathematics, uh, his fellow of Royal Society, uh, FRSC. Uh, he was working for Google. He resigned um, out of his concern over ChatGPT, um, but he's still continuing. He's older and it's, I think, semi-retired. Joshua is much younger. Um, and he has started a large company uh, in, in Montreal. And it's largely because of Joshua that I think a lot of the AI activities in Canada and in fact in the world are based very much in Montreal now. Um, there are three approaches to machine learning. Um, one is called supervised learning. This is the most common one, um, probably 99%, maybe 95% of machine learning is in this area. There's unsupervised learning, a small percentage, then reinforcement learning, which was actually also used to help improve chat GPT, and which is used to uh, help with um, certain select problems. So supervised learning is you're giving examples of inputs and outputs. You're giving desired labeled uh, outputs. Um, that's the example I was showing of how do you learn addition. And the idea is to learn the rules, in this case, learning the rules for addition that map the inputs to the outputs. Uh, it's how you find biomarkers. Uh, it's almost all the things that you guys have described of what you want to be able to do in some form of classification, 
or interpreting or pattern analysis will require supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is saying, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, you have unlabeled data and it tries to figure out rules to find structure in the input data. Um, it, it's, it's actually how humans to some extent learn. Um, it, it requires elements of creativity. It can also be thought of as a simple clustering approach. Um, you, know, you have a whole bunch of socks uh, that you've put through the washer and the dryer, and now you're trying to pair them up. Uh, most of us will try and either match them by their shape or by their color. So you're not gonna put one white sock with one blue sock, or you're not gonna put one large sock with one short sock. So um, we kind of intuitively know how to do this. The computer might not know what to do with socks, but um, if you sort of let it say, how do you cluster it? Or, or let it come up with some rules about how to cluster, it might figure out some of those elements. Reinforcement learning um, is something to uh, essentially give continuous feedback to maximize rewards. Now that is something like gradient descent optimization, which is used in many learning methods, um, but it's also how we learn when someone says, you know, nice job, um, or a dog learns when it's learning to fetch, you pat it on the head. Um, so that's the same, similar technique. I, I would call it a, a a similar form to supervised learning, but to some extent it, it actually optimizes and can optimize faster for very difficult problems. So supervised learning is used for classification, grouping, um, regression, which is a you know, curve fitting. Um, people use it in the filters and ranking and recommending systems, face verification, voice recognition, biomarker identification. Um, gene signal analysis, uh, almost all the things that you guys were describing uh, is what you'd like to do or use um, machine learning for. Unsupervised learning, um, it's when you're doing things like target recognition, um, sock pairing, seismic data analysis, where it's just a lot of noisy data and you're trying to figure out where something significant might be. Reinforcement learning has found most of its use in man-machine environment applications. So um, autonomous car driving is one example and um, uh, chat GPT, uh, especially refinement. So I, I talked about a, a program or a model or uh, a learner um, that's used in machine learning. Um, so different people call it different, different things. I would call it a program because it's, as you'll see, these are computer programs that you still write. Uh, people in machine learning prefer to call them learners or models. Um, and those models um, fall into different classes. Uh, we're gonna look at two in particular. We're gonna look at decision trees, um, uh, which are sub branch of random forests. And we're gonna look at artificial neural networks. But there are others, things like support vector machines, there's genetic algorithms, convolutional neural nets, cursive neural nets, graphical neural nets, Bayesian networks, so on. These are all models that are available. Um, some are very easy to code, like decision trees. Others are quite a bit more difficult. Neural nets are, convolutional neural nets are. Genetic algorithms are easy to code as well. So what are the applications? Um, so a lot of us have heard about self-driving cars. Um, uh, Tesla has some of those operations. There isn't really an autonomous car on the road yet. Game playing, face recognition, fingerprint recognition, traffic sign recognition, uh, automated stock trading, email filtering, gesture recognition for various PlayStation type games, speech recognition, uh, handwriting, radar analysis, uh, medical diagnosis, bioinformatics, and so on. There's, the list goes on and on. Uh, some of you may have things like Siri or Alexa or Google um, um, bots that uh, help control your office, home, or um, apartment, where you can talk to the, the bot um, or the, the, the device. So if you say, you know, Alexa, turn on the light, uh, it'll take the sound, which is an analog idiot, it'll convert that to a digital set. It'll go through various pattern recognition. 
Um, typically, it uses a deep neural net to classify the spoken word and then to identify your, your um, voices, break down and parse out the words, and then uh, create what we call the segregated speech. And from that, comes back and said, you know, what can I do? Or it turns on the lights, or it turns off the lights, or it plays music. Um, this is something that um, maybe about 20% of the population has these things now, um, but it's an example of uh, speech recognition. With your phones, if you use that a lot, uh, which probably 90% of you have, also similar kinds of voice recognition. And it's deep learning that, that does that. If any of you ever had or been called up to say your card, credit card has been compromised, that has been done usually through uh, uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, it's called anom anomaly detection. And it takes data from your credit card purchases over the last number of years and tracks not only where you purchase things, uh, how frequently, whether you tend to buy them and things on weekends or on evenings, uh, the stores you go to, uh, and it extracts patterns to identify this is a typical way that you buy things. And it also includes information about, um, you know, your, your age, your sex, and your job. Um, and, and so it looks for things that would be highly unusual. So if, if you're a male and you're buying, you know, um, women's shoes and women's underwear and tampons, they might suggest this seems unusual. Um, and would say this suggests there's fraud, that you are not who you say you are and someone's buying things under a different name. Or if you've always been living in uh, Winnipeg and then suddenly they're seeing purchases in Saudi Arabia one day and, and Manila the next day and Cape Town the day after, clearly you're not um, someone who travels the world all the time and jet setting around would suggest there's a problem. So. That's how um, fraud prevention is done. Uh, it's highly personalized. Everyone has a profile, and that's how they detect anomalies. One of the, the biggest um, news events in the machine learning world happened about 15 years ago, which is called the Netflix challenge. And I'm sure a number of you have used or subscribed to Netflix, and it, it has options where, you know, um, talks about your preferences or suggests uh, certain TV shows based on what you're, you've been watching. Uh, so Netflix had developed uh, its own algorithm. Uh, it was a traditional programming algorithm, but they opened up a contest to people saying, let's see if you can come up with a better method that predicts what people will prefer based on their viewing habits. So some people like you know, action adventure movies, some like uh, romantic comedies some like foreign films, some like, uh, you know, black and white. Those are all things that you can, you know, infer and classify and get, a, again, a personal profile, not unlike a credit card. And in fact, even as far back as 2009, the winner used, you know, data from hundreds of thousands of users and thousands of movies. It was still 10% better. The machine learning algorithm was 10% better than the Netflix algorithm, which they had spent millions um, programming using traditional methods. So that was a really significant boost. And in fact, Netflix continues to use that. Amazon continues that as well to identify what you might like to purchase. Uh, again, that's machine learning. If you have a cell phone uh, and you take pictures with it, um, most of you will have fairly advanced um, face recognition. And this allows the phone to focus on faces um, and to uh, avoid sort of you ending up focusing on the background or on something that's um, 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 just one individual. So in the picture above, there's one individual uh, who maybe would have been in focus, everyone would have been out, but because the phone was able to recognize faces, uh, everyone's face was um, put into focus. It adjusted the, the aperture and, and timing automatically. Um, so this is, again, is part of the auto focus, uh, auto aperture adjustment, auto shutter adjustment that's used in, in most cameras. Autonomous vehicles um, are also examples of um, where machine learning is, is used, particularly reinforcement learning. They've been testing and testing for more than a decade. Um, 
and driving is a really tough challenge. Uh, you have to be able to recognize a road. Um, you have to recognize changing road conditions. You have to recognize vehicles um, coming at you, road signs. Um, and you have to do things like path planning. You have to, in some cases, learn from how an individual, a good driver drove. In some cases, you have to uh, simulate conditions with bad drivers all around you. Um, so reinforcement learning uh, has seemed to be one of the better methods, but it also has to use um, vision, so pattern recognition. So uh, supervised learning is also needed. Uh, it is still, I would say, uh, an unsolved problem. Uh, it's still something that humans can do better than computers, but probably not for long. So I've given you examples of where machine learning is used in some cases in everyday life with uh, Siri or Alexa or Google or uh, in image recognition or in Netflix or fraud prevention. Obviously, this course is about bioinformatics. And um, machine learning applications in bioinformatics are almost as old as uh, the you know, advanced machine learning. Um, secondary structure prediction, uh, which is uh, predicting uh, from a sequence where alpha helices and beta strands are, finding genes, finding motifs, doing GWAS analysis and SNP typing, disease classification and disease diagnosis, biomarker identification, DNA sequencing. Uh, you can apply it to predict spectra, NMR, and mass spec. It's being used in drug design, drug discovery, uh, also used in protein three-dimensional structure prediction. Uh, I've been doing machine learning for a long time. Um, started in about 20 years ago. Um, probably was really interested in it actually in the late 80s, um, and, but really didn't publish it until um, somewhat later. So we looked at, in this case, um, predicting breast cancer susceptibility using SNPs. Uh, we wrote a review on uh, applications of machine learning and cancer prediction. Uh, apparently, it was one of the first articles in that area. It's been pretty widely cited. Uh, we've used it in protein secondary structure prediction. Um, this was about 15 years ago. More recently, we've been using it in, in, for tools for predicting uh, mass spectra and uh, NMR spectra. And this is very helpful in the field of metabolomics, but it can also be used in proteomics and many other areas. Um, so I, I'm coming at it as, I guess, more of a user and certainly have worked in the area of machine learning and genomics and proteomics and metabolomics and applied it um, in, in a, a wide variety of areas. Uh, this is another application where we're looking at machine learning for genome-wide um, um, analysis associations. Uh, we're looking at um, SNP panels from GWAS studies to determine optimal collections of, of SNPs to uh, make uh, a prediction of certain disease. And we used something called support vector machine, SVM, and ran forest regression to calculate um, these receiver operator characteristic curves. So again, this is another example of using uh, machine learning to help, uh, in this case, genomics and biomarker identification. Now, there are other applications. I'm not just going to talk about things I've done, um, but there are some interesting ones. Uh, here's a case where they use SNP variants, looking at literally hundreds of them with different phenotypes. And they're basically looking at the SNPs for heat sensitivity. So some people can hold on to a boiling hot cup of coffee for um, hours and others um, have to use you know oven mitts basically so some people are uh, high, highly sensitive to heat and some are not sensitive to heat um, and they know some of the genes that are associated with it they did the trip v1 trip a1 genotypes um, they did next generation sequencing to look at all of these variations um, and from the um, use of, of non-supervised, something called swarm clustering, they were able to um, identify and, and pull out um, 31 gene loci. So they reduced a large number to a smaller number. They identified and started categorizing people who could be sensitive and which genetic components to those SNPs were um, allowed you to categorize people as heat and non-heat sensitive. Uh, some of you have maybe worked with the MinION um, 
this little tiny DNA sequencer that uses nanopores. It's the Oxford nanopore DNA sequencer. Uh, they've been working on it probably for 15 years. Um, and it does long read sequencing. And I've been watching it and working with people uh, on Minion for many, many years. And essentially they use crowdsourcing to help solve the DNA sequencing problem. Um, so the nanopore uh, is sort of embedded into a, an electrically sensitive membrane. And so when DNA is passed through the nanopore, you can get a, a change in an electrical uh, readout. It goes up, it goes down, depending on the sequence. But it's not obvious. Uh, you know, it's not always down when it's an A, and it's not always up when it's a C. It could be something intermediate. It depends on both the, the length of the sequence, the number of repeats, how much it changes. So if it's ACGT, ACGT, um, that might produce a very different signal than AAA, CCC, GGG, TTT. So in this case, they had to use hidden Markov models, um, uh, recurrent neural nets, uh, and a variety of other machine learning methods. And many, many people tried and, and adapted. And as I said, this is crowdsourcing machine learning. But eventually, they solved it. And, and so you can take these readouts, which I'm showing on the lower left. Um, and those signal intensities can be read out as letters, as DNA sequence now. And it's quite accurate quite fast, incredibly cheap. Um, and so this is where machine learning uh, converted something that seemed to be at the time impossible to do uh, to something that is now widely used for long read sequencing. Uh, there are examples of something called deep bind. It's a deep neural net tool for predicting the sequence uh, specificity between D of DNA and RNA uh, binding proteins. So how do you predict which proteins and based on their sequence um, where they'll bind on um, a strand of DNA or on a strand of RNA. And so this is, you know, taking a whole list of known motifs, um, performing scans, then looking at features, using neural nets, targets, uh, updating the parameters. So very much a, a neural net approach, but it is something that can uh, do quite well in terms of predicting uh, which proteins will bind where and potentially why. There's a deep neural net, deep bioseq that can use deep learning convolutional neural net and can analyze RNA-seq data. Uh, you don't have to do DNA alignment. You don't have to do a lot of sequence pro processing. You can work with directly with fast Q files. Uh, it assesses the quality of the reads uh, and people have adapted it to do single cell sequencing and chip sequence analysis. So again, um, applications of machine learning, looking at sequence data or even just fast Q files. People have been using machine learning to optimize the design of CRISPR target sequences. Um, so uh, you know, these have to be uh, optimized to some extent if you want to be able to do efficient uh, gene insertion, gene replacement. Uh, same sort of thing if you wanted to optimize other types of sequences in terms of recognition. So again, uh, machine learning and molecular biology is very useful. In many of these cases, we're looking at, at sequence data. And so that's where we're focusing a fair bit uh, for the examples we'll be choosing. Um, so um, sequence data is, is like learning a language. So just like ChatGPT learns to recognize you know, words, which are basically sequences of, of letters. Um, DNA sequence data is something that's um, very amenable to, to machine learning applications as is protein sequence data. Um, you can also use machine learning in areas of cancer applications, um, you know, system support tools for cancer screening. So this takes um, uh, genealogical data. Uh, it can take mammogram imaging data. It can take genetic test data. Um, so very diverse types of data, and it'll feed that data in, uh, including electronic health record data. Um, and performs integration, uh, and then comes up with a, a risk assessment for someone's likelihood of developing cancer. You can do this uh, also for you know, summing together uh, metabolomic and proteomic data together to help come up with um, better risk scores or predictions. Um, 
so rather than relying on a physician using machine learning tools, they were able to show that this not only uh, improved the cancer risk assessment, but also was much faster. Um, some of you may have used 23andMe, um, and they're always changing, but they had a, essentially, uh, not only do they um, take your genome and analyze it, and it's essentially a SNP test and performs a few hundred thousand SNP assessments, but because they've had many, many people take the test, and because people sign off and say, use the data in whatever you, way you want, um, they were able to take uh, data from 600,000 people, take their GWAS data, which they get from 23andMe, and integrate information that people provided them about their weight and height, therefore their BMI and their lifestyle, to, to come up with um, sort of a genetic weight predictor. Um, and in this case, it's predicting that this person will have a tendency to be slightly overweight. Uh, your genes predispose you to weight above 3% above average. Um, I'm not sure if this is probably something that's only offered to people in the US as opposed to people um, with 23andMe in Canada. And they've run into a few challenges, a few problems, because in many cases, GWAS um, data isn't that accurate uh, in the sense of being able to predict um, a physiological outcome. Uh, tumor genomics, uh, looking at single nucleotide variants or SNPs as well, tumor samples. Uh, this one uses a fairly simple technique, a random forest, which is a collection of decision trees. Um, and it was used to um, essentially classify tumors. Um, and I think some of you guys have talked about this. So this um, you know, had to have a collection of you know, appropriate data. They wanted to have um, both normals, uh, they selected certain types of features. Um, they worried about things like strand bias, variant allele fractions, batch effects. But by including those features and those elements in their model, they were able to get um, almost perfect sensitivity and sense specificity, which is much better than what humans could do. Newborn screening, uh, something that any of you who are under the age of 30 have had. Um, so within two to three hours after you're born, they take a blood sample, they run it through a mass spec, and they determine if you have a metabolic disorder. Something obviously none of you remember, something that none of your parents even know about, but in fact, um, metabolomic screening is the most widely used test in the world. 300 million people have had it. More than a million people have benefited from it. Um, but people do make mistakes. And so by using machine learning uh, to help interpret the, the mass spectral data that they collect from these blood spots, they were able to reduce the number of false positives from 21 to 2 um, for phenylketonuria, from 30 to 10 to hypermethionemia, and uh, from 209 to 46 for uh, another metabolic deficiency with a carnitine deficiency. Um, one of the biggest breakthroughs um, in machine learning, which I think, I hope some of you've heard about, was for AlphaFold or AlphaFold 2. Uh, again, maybe we can just uh, take a poll. Um, if you could, in the chat, just indicate if you've ever heard of AlphaFold 2, um, or uh, if the TA is going to look at how many people have voted yes. Um, Anyways, it was considered the breakthrough of the year in 2021. Um, that might be when most people were hibernating in their basement from COVID, so it, it didn't kind of make the headlines I think people would hope to. But AlphaFold2 has solved one of the biggest challenges in biology, which is the protein folding problem. And it's put a lot of structural biologists out of a job, um, but it's changed how we think about structural biology. So AlphaFold2 used uh, huge amounts of data of already solved protein folded uh, structures that were in the protein data bank. Um, it then used a lot of um, sequence data because we've sequenced literally millions of proteins through DNA sequencing, and then did multiple sequence alignment. And from these literally millions of multiple sequence alignments, um, they uh, did something called embedding, uh, which 
um, is a fairly time consuming process, but it encoded both the alignments and the sequence information intelligently. Uh, it also had information about pairwise distances or distance matrices. It also did coevolution analysis, which is shown at the bottom, which is something that people picked up about 10 years ago, which noticed that some proteins, when we look at multiple sequence alignments, um, there are correlated mutations that if one is changed, then the other is changed. And this suggests um, a constraint that these residues have to be in close contact with each other. Um, so all of this information was being used and put into a fairly sophisticated um, deep neural net um, tool uh, to create AlphaFold 1 and then AlphaFold 2. Uh, and this is AlphaFold 2's performance with, at the time, the two other top performing programs. One is called Rosetta, which made news about 15 years ago, and uh, a team uh, Zhang et al. I'm not sure if they're Emory University or something. And they were trying to solve the structure for uh, an open reading frame from the COVID protein. They, um, the structure had just been determined. Uh, and then they asked the, the team from Emory, Zhang, and then they asked Rosetta at University of Washington uh, to run it through. Um, the, the Zhang model was um, completely random coil, had nothing to do with the actual structure. Rosetta knew it was mostly beta sheet, but there's actually no similarity really overall. The alpha fold two structure was essentially bang on. And this was an example of a protein. There was essentially no sequence homologue. They couldn't do machine um, modeling at all, homology modeling. And, and so this was just quite striking. And because this was published right during the COVID pandemic, because people are trying to find target proteins and ways to, to find drugs, um, this is sort of, uh, I guess, the nail in the coffin for these other programs, but also um, a real triumph for um, what machine learning can do for um, protein structure and drug discovery. So I'll stop right here, uh, and maybe I'll ask if people have any questions um, or comments, and maybe I could also get a feedback from the, the polls that we took. How many people have actually heard of AlphaFold before? I think there were some 21 responses. 20 were yes as one no in that case, yeah. Okay, so either 95% of you have heard of it or 50% of you have heard of it. Um, the, um, so does anyone have any questions about um, you know, what I've mentioned so far? Because um, this is sort of, a, I say, the gentle introduction to machine learning. So I assume by the long silence, there are no questions. Sukanta has his hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, Sukanta. Yeah. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, so you mentioned that data mining is different from the sort of traditional machine learning, but so is, Unsupervised learning, not a kind of data mining as well? Um, it could be seen as that, um, although it traditionally hasn't been applied to data mining. Um, the um, Typically, data mining is, is done more with, with text. Um, it could also be done with um, large you know, tables of data. Um, and on the supervised learning um, is done more with, like, I'll say, numeric data. Um, and it may be looking for general patterns, as I said, seismic data analysis, um, um, maybe peak finding um, would be examples of perhaps some unsupervised learning. Clustering is a pseudo un supervised learning method. But as I say, most people don't really do a lot of unsupervised learning. Machine learning, uh, or I guess data mining is essentially extracting, it's pulling information out, and then looking, um, building up patterns, um, then perhaps like going on to, from those patterns, looking at inferences. Um, it can be algorithmically done, uh, as opposed to 
uh, probabilistically done. But yeah, I suppose someone could apply unsupervised learning to data mining if they wanted. I see, I see. Okay, yeah, thank you. I think uh, Nazia has a comment or question. Okay. Nazia, would you want to read it or should I just read out from the chat? I can read out. So she's asking, wondering if we will get to learn more about how GWAS summary stats can be used with ML. Yeah, we, we won't have that in this course. Um, the paper that I highlighted in that GWAS um, rocks curve um, paper actually talks about how you can take GWAS summary stats and and um, extract information or or calculate information out of it. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is most GWAS data is only available in the summary form. We, we have to get otherwise very specialized permission to get the, uh, the really detailed data. But summary data is widely available. And, and so um, when it's in databases and there are ways of extracting, I think, some useful information out of that using machine learning. And so that paper explains it. In, in many cases, I think, you know, what we're trying to get you guys set up for is so that you can look at other papers that do something similar to what you want to do, but look at it with a different eye afterwards. Uh, maybe not be so intimidated by what they're describing or be a little um, more aware of the language they're using. Um, so we're, we're, you know, in two days, we're not going to be able to solve every problem um, or show you how to solve every problem. But to give you more of grounding so that you can, as I say, intelligently read some, some papers or um, um, download some software and, and know what you're doing to, to actually uh, install it so it, it helps you in your project. Likewise, you know, you're free to talk to Vasu and Sagan and Mark because they've solved lots of machine learning problems for lots of people. And uh, that's why we have them as TAs here. Thanks. Um, so we do have a question from Chad. I'll take first question from Chad and then we have two hands raised. So a question from Sonetra Das in the chat. What are the applications of genetic algorithm? So genetic algorithms are, are more often used for optimization. Um, and, and searching through space to, to optimize, but then you can use a genetic algorithm as part of the um, optimization process that's used in learning. So a, a genetic algorithm uh, would be, a, I guess, a, a tool that would be part of, uh, or potentially part of some uh, optimization part of, of learning. Um, I think there's some people who have used genetic algorithms as, as a learning process. Um, genetic algorithms are, are very simple to program. They sort of, you know, uh, just like genes, um, you know, cross over and hybridize. Um, you can and will mutate and transform and frame shift. That's sort of a way of, of moving your data or configurations or examples around. And um, it turns out to be a fairly efficient way of optimizing things. And this is how evolution has happened. Um, you know, genes have uh, crossed over and mutated to change from you know, single cell microbes to you know, giraffes and elephants um, to adapt to different conditions. So um, this is... Uh, how you know, optimization can be done, um, which is part of machine learning. Yeah. Uh, probably Nasli, please go ahead. What do you question? Um, I was wondering the effect of the quality of the training set that you will have for the machine learning. Um, I was using off of all two a lot. And I know like the coevolution theory and where is it coming from? Uh, but I was wondering what did they do much better? Like, uh, is it more algorithm is much better or their training set is better? Uh, there are lots of things sort of simultaneously that made AlphaFold 2 better. Um, and there's a couple of articles that have appeared, one I think in Scientific American last year, which sort of talked about the history of what they did and how they 
you know, rewrote AlphaFold into AlphaFold 2. Um, a lot of it was the, um, the machine learning model they chose. It was more advanced and more sophisticated. Um, and so um, I think they attribute a lot to that. I think it was also making better use of the data. A lot of people had just used coevolution, nothing else. Um, the difference distance matrices were critical and people hadn't really used that before. Um, I think they have a really good um, energy optimization function, um, which you know, gives high quality coordinate um, and um, um, produces things that better. I think they had reached a critical threshold in terms of the number of sequences and the number of structures. Um, so you know, things start happening when you get beyond a certain threshold. And this is something that happened with the large language models. You know, chat GPT was kind of useless two years ago, but as the model grew, um, then it suddenly passed a threshold um, in terms of the number of data points that were in it. And this seems to be a, um, I mean, you can experience it yourself. You know, you struggle to, you know, do a, a problem or to, you know, uh, perform a gymnastic trick. You practice, you practice, and suddenly at some point it just, it happens. And that's where the point where some of these models reach where um, they, they've done it enough or they have enough data or they've tried it enough times that it, it now has figured it out. So I, I think it was a combination of many things for AlphaFold 2. Um, um, but there's no one single one I think that, that they can point to as being the real reason why it got so much better. Thank you. Uh, Kion, go ahead, please. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I actually do have two questions um, regarding the um, ML and the actual course. Um, looking at the just material that you have shared, um, I have not seen any like kind of um, normalizing methods to um, pre-clean the data set before you actually put in the training set. Um, do you have any, um, do we have any kind of resources to um, get trained on this? And um, second question is that I've heard there is a, some kind of black box in terms of machine learning or even deep learning meaning that um, sometimes the model do not find the right features, but looking at even batch effect or things like that and choose that feature and give out the wrong result. So um, would you able to explain a bit more about this thing, the black box? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of you know data cleaning, uh, I will talk about that coming up here. I'll, I mean, there isn't any single algorithm or magic solution to data cleaning, um, you have to be, you have to understand your data. Uh, if you have no idea what your data is, what it's about, um, you won't know how to clean it. Um, but there are some pretty standard things about, you know, in, imputing missing values or um, um, normalizing things so they're within a certain range. Um, in terms of the black box concept, um, yeah, um, I mean, there are some machine learning algorithms that are not black boxes. Uh, decision trees and even random forests are not black boxes, um, which is the reason why some people prefer them because they can you know, look at the code and look at the results and rationalize what's going on or what's, what's been chosen and why. Neural nets are black boxes, although there are some methods that kind of allow you to figure out a little bit about what it's trying to do. Um, you can do something called feature selection, which makes sure that your model isn't choosing random useless data to make its inferences or to become overtrained. Um, we'll talk about that coming up here shortly. Mm, not sure if we have a time for another question. There's a question in the chat. Okay, we can do that one. From Shavat, um, could you please discuss about recommended data size, data points to work with ML models for accurate predictions? 
Sometimes it's very challenging to have a big data set due to different factors, including cost, efficient genetic material extraction in the presence of inhibitors, especially working with environmental samples. So the first part of the question was, could you please discuss about the recommended data size data points to work with? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll talk about that a bit more, but it's sometimes hard to know exactly what the size should be. Um, there are tricks. Um, usually you need thousands of examples. Is a, it's a general rule of thumb. So trying to have a few dozen is barely, never works basically. A few hundred sometimes can work. But there are ways of um, working with small data sets and I guess coming up with intelligent or ingenious ways of um, uh, supplementing or amplifying the data. So in the case of AlphaFold, uh, we only had 100,000 protein structures. Um, but we knew enough about protein structures to say that if you've got a very, very similar sequence, it's also going to have a very similar structure. So effectively, what they did is they used sort of the equivalent of homology modeling to create literally millions of structures um, for which AlphaFold could train. Um, there's other techniques for um, chemical structures uh, where you can write the chemical structure in uh, a string called a smile string, but there's many variants of smiles that'll produce exactly the same structure. So you can um, boost the number of uh, smile strings or example structures by uh, using um, variant smiles or non-canonical smiles. Um, that again, if you only had a subset of 100 structures, you could create a million smile strings, uh, which then allow your model to uh, have a lot more data um, to kind of learn the same phenomena. Um, it, it has to be you know, data specific. So, uh, and you have to be, you know, you have to think about it in a few ways. Uh, so, you know, the skill in machine learning isn't so much necessarily, you know, which, which algorithm or model you choose. It's a lot about this defining your problem, constructing your data set, um, transforming your data set. Those are where the real winners are. And, and the best machine learners are the ones who do those things well, whereas choosing the model is just pretty rote right now. Okay, I think we'll, we'll probably have to get underway because we only have about 20 minutes left here, I think. Um, so this is the machine learning workflow. And, and this is one that I'll show over and over again, but it's one that you guys need to memorize, I think, if there's anything I can get out of this course. Um, and, and there's sort of six steps. And the first step is really defining your problem um, and having a target solution. Um, a lot of people make mistakes by not defining the problem very well. Um, you know, I want to solve the world's problems. Well, that's not well defined. Um, I want to solve the protein folding problem. That's reasonably well defined, but it's say, given a protein sequence, I want to determine the three-dimensional structure within you know, two angstrom RMSD. That's a better defined one. It has a def definition. Um, and proposing a solution, which might be saying, I want to use the protein data bank as a training set, or I want to use a protein data bank plus a whole bunch of homology models, plus coevolution, plus multiple sequence alignment to help um, with this process. So you have to think about your problem long and hard, identify whether you have enough data, think if it's well-defined enough, think if it's something that gives you both an answer. So in the case of the protein folding problem, we had answers, we had structures, we had 100,000 structures. Uh, so that was a large database. Um, but we also knew that there were millions of sequences that we hadn't solved for. So that was a, you know, a, a well, chosen problem, a prominent problem, but it, it had enough training data, or if you thought about it in smart ways, uh, could create enough training data to make it solvable. So once you've chosen your problem, then you have to construct your data set. Um, 
And so GAIN and AlphaFold 2, they had data. Some of it was clean, some of it wasn't. Um, we had to do a lot of data cleaning. Um, but it took a long time to build those data sets, to do those multiple sequence alignments, to run the programs. The multiple sequence alignments weren't done with machine learning. They were done with multiple sequence alignment programs. Um, you know, structure analysis was done by, again, programs, not machine learning. But those produced the data that was then put into the machine learning. Um, you have to then transform your data sets and select features. Um, so that was also important for AlphaFold 2. They had to um, you know, normalize distances. This is why they use the difference distance matrix, I think uh, helped a lot. Um, they had to uh, normalize their data. They had to do some feature selection, uh, although in some cases the um, models themselves were able to do feature selection. Um, and then they chose, you know, their, um, I guess, uh, transformer network uh, was their model that they eventually chose. Um, but you choose a model. And many people actually, best machine learning groups will, will run about 10 or 12 different models. Um, and they'll see which one performs best. And you can't necessarily know which one will perform best. And each of them still needs little tweaks. You know, some models have to be normalized. Some don't, uh, that is the data has to be normalized or transformed, some don't have to be. So you have to know which ones need to be manipulated and which ones don't. And then you run the models, you assess the performance. So once you've you know, trained your model on some training data, then you have to test that model. And this is where a lot of people make mistakes, um, where they just basically stop at the training set, they publish and say, I've got it all solved. So then someone else takes their model, runs it on their own data set, and the model fails completely. This is why you have to do things called validation. And you have to use things like leave one out or X-fold cross-validation. Once you've done appropriate testing and validation, then you can say, OK, my model's finished. Now it's ready to do things. And so in the case of AlphaFold, they said, yeah, we've tested it. We validated it. We trained it uh, as much as we could. Uh, they were happy with this performance, and then they released it to the public and have released all kinds of models. Um, so the program can be downloaded. You can run it on GPU computers. Um, most people make use of AlphaFold just by downloading the structures. I mean, how many of you have actually run AlphaFold on a GPU computer? Um, you could just put up your hand or put it into chat. Because I think a lot of people use AlphaFold or claim to use AlphaFold, but all they're doing is just downloading the structure that was already generated by AlphaFold. Uh, it's still fine, uh, but it's 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 running the program is one thing. Um, making, uh, you know, getting the results from the program is is a different one. So when you're choosing problems, um, obviously you want to work on a problem that hasn't been solved or that is interesting to you in your research. Um, sometimes people propose problems that are very easily solved mathematically um, or statistically. Um, so, and some of you, at least from what I heard, were describing problems that I think would probably be better solved by a, an algorithm. Uh, or a, a technique um, than a, pro, a traditional program rather than machine learning. Um, sometimes, obviously, try and choose things that are just too tough to do uh, or require a huge amount of training or knowledge. Generally, you want to look at things like finding patterns, uh, classifying things, uh, classifying groups, identifying certain features. Um, but the other thing that a lot of people gained from some of the descriptions you had, um, there weren't a lot of training data to work with. Um, or in examples where the answer just isn't known. Um, so, you know, I want to find dark metal, write a machine learning program to find dark matter. Well, we haven't found dark matter and we don't know what it looks like. We don't know the answer. Um, the same sort of thing as, you know, uh, write a machine learning program to write my thesis. Um, that's pretty open-ended. There isn't, you know, there's lots of thesis examples and you could probably use ChatGPT to write a pretty arbitrary thesis, but it would be mostly hallucinated, 
hallucinatory. So, you know, you need to have um, training data and AlphaFold is a good example. They had lots of training data. Uh, or you need to be a, a smart to come up with ways of amplifying or boosting the amount of training data that you already have. Not so that it's just purely made up, but in the sense that it's reasonable or analogous. Um, constructing your data set. Um, in this case, you have to get your data from a reliable source. Um, I've seen lots of very poor quality data. And um, this is where, again, most people make mistakes and most people just you know, download the, the data set they're given. Um, it, it's a situation of garbage in equals garbage out. The data has to be labeled. This is what you're doing in machine learning. So you have to have, it, you know, they have to have answers to them. Remember, there's an input and an output. So you could have categorical, you know, male, female, healthy, sick, uh, nominal or numerical. Um, so you might have numbers associated with things. Um, you can have um, relevant parameters um, to describe the phenomena. So if you're talking about protein folding, you know, understanding the phase of the moon or the astrological sign doesn't have any relevance to protein folding. Uh, it won't help with predicting DNA binding motifs. But, you know, obviously the sequence does, or um, something about the secondary structure could, or uh, something about the uh, organism uh, may have some relevance, or the temperature at which the organism lives. Those could all have some effect. They might have some way of contributing um, in terms of DNA binding or protein folding. Um, so, you know, use your knowledge, use your intuition uh, about what sort of data you want to include. Uh, because if you miss the central features and you try and predict without those, you know, key pieces of information, your machine learning model won't do very well at all. So trying to predict protein structure without the protein sequence, it won't work. Um, so you need training data you need testing data and you need validation data. So there's three types of data that you have to create when you start off with the machine learning. I'd say there's no right answer. Um, people can get away um, perhaps with a, as minimal, as few as a thousand examples. I've seen situations where people have had as few as a hundred examples, but then they used you know, smart data amplification methods to get you know, tens of thousands. Most of the average uh, machine learning problems um, that people work with have, say, 10,000 to 100,000 examples. Uh, we'll be doing one which uses maybe about 700, and you'll see it doesn't do great. And I think if we had more, it would have done better. If you're doing really tough problems, um, this is where people talk about parameters and how many billions of parameters and millions of parameters in large language models. It can be millions or billions of examples. So ChatGPT um, and others have, you know, between 10 and 100 billion parameters and used hundreds of millions or billions of words and text and examples. And they had to use, you know, this is for deep learning. So not every problem you guys are thinking of has these requisite numbers of examples. And, and that's something that might constrain what you want to do. Uh, but there are also, I like say, smart ways of taking relatively modest amounts of data and, and amplifying it to get to the stage where you can do machine learning. So after you've constructed your data set, then you have to transform your data and select your features. Um, so cleaning up the data, remove repeats, fill in or impute missing values, reformat so things are compatible, um, look for outliers, um, group classes. These are all things that people often don't do but are needed to do. And this means you have to know something about your data and we call it data cleaner, data cleansing. Um, you might convert categorical or named or nominal data to numeric ones. You can use things like one-hot encoding, which is very helpful for um, 
uh, machine learning. You can normalize uh, skewed data, um, that is making it more Gaussian. You can range scale. So there's data transformation in something called feature engineering. You can add additional features, uh, include obvious relationships that you know about the field. You can select some features that's called feature selection, keeping relevant data, but remove irrelevant data. And this is where human intuition helps. And it's a lot of the best learning algorithms used human intuition to do feature selection. So one hot coding is an important thing. We'll see it a few times uh, later today, um, where the way that we think in our brain, you know, here's a four balls, one is red, another blue, another green, and another one's blue. We understand color, our brains understand it, uh, machines don't, so you can convert colors to a sign of a, a digital signature um, with the three uh, binary, uh, three bit kind of encoding. Um, you know, red is one zero zero, green is zero, or blue is zero one zero, and green is zero zero one. And now you've done one hot encoding. Um, you can do this for colors. You can do this for letters and sequence. Uh, one hot encoding is really easy to do, uh, but uh, it doesn't give you context. So if you've got you know the, the word R E D, um, there's a sequence of letters, uh, and you know if it's E R D, it doesn't mean the color red. If it's D R E, it doesn't mean the color red. It has to be R E D. Um, so embedding gives you um, features with similar influence to the data string. It's, it's sequences or words. It gives you similar values for specific features. You can encode or embed sequence data. You can in hot, hot encode sequence data. Um, but if you've embedded sequence data, that's telling more information there. It's useful in um, natural language processing, named entity recognition, text summarization, but people have used it in gene finding and protein structure prediction as well. Again, it's sort of with text and words or letters and where the, the sequence of letters or words has important meaning. So here we can take um, eight or nine conditions, man, woman, boy, girl, prince, princess, queen, king, and monarch, and we can you know, create a nine bit encoding. A man is one zero 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 zero. A woman is zero one zero zero zero. Boy is so on and so. You have this big matrix, and it's you know, we're just a whole bunch of ones and zeros. But you guys would probably notice that you know, men and women, uh, boy is similar to a man, but younger a prince is similar to a man because that's what you call uh, male royalty. A king is you know higher up than a prince, and a monarch is similar to a king or a queen or a princess. So you can then embed things so rather than having this nine by nine matrix, you can have a three by nine matrix. And you can give terms instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you can have femininity, youth, and royalty. So man is not feminine, but a woman is. A man is not young, a woman is not young, but a boy is, and a girl is. A prince is royal and is also a youth um, and is not female. Uh, a princess is a female, is a youth, and is associated with royalty. So you've now encoded things, there's sort of a richer amount of data. And, and so this is embedding and it has context. Um, and this is quite useful actually in machine learning, but it's, it requires some intelligence and obviously there are different ways of embedding. We could have had three categories, we could have had two categories, four categories. Um, Another part of machine learning involves feature engineering. We have to do things where we manipulate the data. We scale, we transform, normalize. Um, makes it more suitable for modeling. Um, it improves the model performance. It reduces the impact of way outlying data that's just too big or too small. So in fact, it, it makes thing, sure that things are on the same scale. And so if you have you know, numbers at 0 0.0001 and other numbers at 10 to the plus 28, um, you're not gonna get much results. Um, you have to scale these things. Um, and when things are of different orders of magnitude or different ranges, you have to make sure that those, especially numeric data has been scaled or normalized. Um, this is important because we do derivatization, we do derivatives, we do logistic regression, uh, artificial neural nets, uh, SVMs. Wherever a derivative is involved, you have to have some kind of scaling. 
and that allows the data to converge, allows derivatives to converge. Uh, we don't get, you know, not a number or zeros. Uh, we can do normalizing, which things get rescaled and shifted so they range between zero and one, or we can standardize, which means that things have a standard deviation of one. But these are techniques that people have learned over the years that really make a difference in terms of model performance. We can do transformations. We can take a skewed distribution of data and change it to a Gaussian distribution. This is called log transformation. This is often, sometimes often used in, in data analysis and manipulation in machine learning. Likewise, not all the data is relevant for training. Um, and so feature selection is something that you can do both automatically or manually to choose the features that contribute most to the accuracy of the model. Uh, if you include irrelevant features like zodiac signs, then it reduces the accuracy. So you might in this case have you know, seven features, you do feature selection manually or automatically, you get rid of four of them. And then so finally your model only works with three features to do its um, selection. Sometimes people have um, too little data. You know, you've got two points and you can draw a line. If you include the other eight points or nine points here, then um, you realize that it's not what it's happening. It's, it's not a straight line, uh, it's a, a reverse L. So those are things about how to transform your data set. A lot of mistakes are made in that. Selecting features, a lot of people don't do it or don't use intelligent uh, feature selection. Next one is to choose a model. Um, all of these are learners or models, decision trees, neural nets, hidden Markov models, SVMs, GNNs, uh, CNNs, belief nets. There isn't any way to know which one is the best. So as I've said before, try a bunch of them. Uh, some do remarkably good, some do remarkably poor. Decision tree is the simplest of all. Uh, it's easy to implement. This is a decision tree about who survived in the Titanic. Um, you know, as a rule, it was women first, um, so a lot of men died. But of the males, um, they chose children to stay, to be put into lifeboats. And if those were young enough, um, some survived. If they were old, then they mostly died. And then if there are lots of uh, brothers and sisters, they also had a better percentage of, of surviving. So from this, you could kind of predict uh, who would survive. And, and the, the computer can take the data and actually figure out how those decisions were made. And I think most of us know that, you know, women and children first uh, when a boat's sinking. Um, decision trees have branches, uh, which we call edges, and they have nodes, which we also call leaves. Data scaling is not needed for decision trees. So this is actually really nice. It, it means you don't have to do all those transformations I was talking about because it doesn't require derivatives. A random forest is essentially a collection of a whole bunch of decision trees. This has you know, three decision trees that are shown, but it might be hundreds. It's an ensemble learning method, and you can do with decision trees and with uh, regression or random forest ones, you can do both classification and you can do curve fitting or regression. And it takes a collection of uh, unconnected trees and you do essentially prediction by committee. And a lot of people, a lot of governments and organizations work with committees and everyone comes up with slightly different decisions, but you kind of a, a, a majority vote or average those um, many decisions to come up with usually a final result. And often those are much better than the single decision tree. ANNs, artificial neural networks, try and simulate the brain. Uh, they're connections of nodes and units. These are artificial neurons and they're modeled similar to brains. And ANNs can be used for classification and for curve fitting. Hidden Markov models are another type of model. They're probabilistic graphical models. They can be used to model sequence data or events over time, uh, Markovian events. They use emission and transmission probabilities. This is showing how you can predict whether the weather will be leading to a dry or damp or soggy soccer field, depending on whether things are rainy, cloudy, or sunny. And there are various probabilities that are shown with numbers around them, various hidden states. HMMs are something we used to teach. They're incredibly complicated, and they've been largely replaced by what are called LSTMs, long short-term memory uh, neural nets, which seem to be much easier to implement and also probably easier to understand. But they're very good for predicting time trends, sequential events, um, things like predicting the weather, 
but they're also been used to do, you know, identifying sequence motifs for many years in bioinformatics. Support vector machines, never understood why they call them that, because they aren't machines, they're algorithms. Um, they use something called a kernel trick, but it's another transformation trick to take the data, uh, finds a boundary in multi multiple dimensions, we call it a hyperplane, to classify things. It's very similar to something that was developed in the 30s called discriminant analysis or linear discriminant analysis. SVMs can be used for classification, biomarker finding. They can be used for regression as well, just like the neural nets and random forests. So these are different models. Um, and I could go on and on, but we don't have time. Um, the testing and validation is another one where many people make mistakes. Um, it's trying to avoid using too few parameters, which we call underfitting, where the most common mistake is overfitting using too many. And here's some examples of underfitting where you've got a whole collection of data points and you just draw a straight line. It's probably not the good fit. You can see in the middle one where it's just right. And then the tendency for most machine learning algorithms, especially people new to the field, is to do the thing on the far right, which is you know connect every point. Um, overfitting um, means that uh, you basically model noise. And it means that your predictors will be terrible. Underfitting is rare, uh, but it typically happens when you just don't have a whole lot of data or you didn't do a lot of training. Uh, as I said, this is something that almost everyone falls into the trap. Um, overfitting is one that I see just about everyone, even the experts do. Um, the way you prevent that is you have external validation sets that you need to do cross-fold validation. You can do leave one out or you can do permutation testing. So typically people will take their data set, their training data, and they'll divide it into two groups. About two thirds of the data is training. And then one third is what's gonna be used. It's gonna be held out and it's gonna be used for testing. When you train, it must never see what you call the test data ever. You can then divide your training data into smaller parts which can avoid a problem called training bias. So if this is your training data, which is now just two thirds of your total data, we can take the training data. So if there's 66 examples out of the hundred, we can divide it into three folds. So 22 sets of each, and we can do three rounds of testing and then training on that first data set. Uh, so we train on two thirds of the 66, so that's 44 and test on 22, but we divvied up in different ways. And this is how we do our training. But then we're still going to have our outside or holdout set, which is 33 examples that we didn't see here, which we're, we're going to need to do to validate. But this is a way of making sure, uh, especially if you have enough data, that you're not getting too much of a bias. You can also do leave one out, which instead of dividing into thirds or threefold or fivefold, we just train on everything except one example and then repeat the process by you know, to taking another one to take out. So instead of doing you know, three rounds of training, you might do you know, 66 rounds of training. Um, it's maybe not the best method, uh, but it is one that people have used. Permutation testing is another approach where let's say you have some you know, unlabeled data. It's this big cluster in the left corner, and then you've labeled it. And so the reds are one label and the blues are another label. Uh, and then you have a classifier that groups things and that classifier pulls things apart very nicely. And you can see the red cluster in one side and the blue cluster in another. So our classifier has done a nice job of separating this labeled data. We can then say, well, is this a, a good classifier? This model, is it good? Um, well, then we can relabel our data which I've done just below in the middle. So I call it a permuted data. You can see the reds are different, the blues are different. I run the same classifier on that permuted data, and then I see what I get. And as you can see, in this case, it didn't separate them at all. And I can do this over and over and over again, and I can measure how well the separation is done. And in this case, the, the one in the upper right corner, the classification is very good, and its separation score is excellent, and it's way above the norm. And all the other ones that we ran, they just clustered all together. And so they're in this big cluster on the left side of that graph. So the arrow marks the classifier. And we can say this, this classifier is really robust. It's 
it works for the data. It's not just a happenstance where everything is you know, classified all the time the same way. Um, so it's not overtrained um, and, it, and it works. You can assess how things are done when you're you know, classifying things. We talk about true positives, false positives. We can measure sensitivity and specificity. This is called a confusion matrix. It can be a two by two, it can be a three by three, four by four, but it's essentially measuring your performance and how many times did you make mistakes? How many times did you not make mistakes? How many were um, right when they were wrong and wrong when they were right? Um, we can do this through something called, um, you know, looking at patients, there's a collection of, so there's a thousand patients, 500 are um, positive, 500 are negative. They have different scores, genetic scores, metabolite scores, protein scores. The ones in orange are the, the negatives, the ones in blue are the positives. And there's gonna be some overlap. Um, some of them will have measurements that are, you know, would say that they're negative, but they're actually positive and vice versa. And you can see those regions marked at the bottom where we marked false positives and false negatives. And again, we can look at that overlap of those two distributions and calculate our performance, our sensitivity, our specificity with SN and SP. And we can use something called a receiver operating characteristic curve uh, to measure that performance, to measure the true positive rate and the false positive rate um, for classifiers like a binary classifier. So here's our distribution, the red and the blue. And if we cut them up into different regions and say the far one on the sort of, I guess it's a purple one, uh, there's none of the red there. And then the far left, there's a kind of a brown one. There's none of the blue in that one, but in between there's mixes of the red and blue um, of, of both populations. So we can calculate how many times based on these colored dots and those colored lines, how many times we had a false positive and how many times we had a true positive. And we can plot it on this curve. And you can see that the area under those curves is sort of plotted in this, in this graph. And we can draw a line on that graph. That is a rock curve. So each of those colored lines each correspond to each of the colored dots based on the area that we calculated uh, under the red or the blue, which correspond to the the X and the Y axis. And there's gonna be a trade-off. Some are gonna make things more specific. Some are things gonna make things more sensitive. And uh, this one is um, low sensitivity and high specificity. This is high um, sensitivity, but low specificity. And this one kind of at the corner or the bend zone is the best. And we can calculate the area under these rock curves. And this gives us a performance. A straight line is terrible. That's a random predictor. A rock curve, 100% or 90% area in the curve, that's a very good predictor. 70%, it's not anything to publish or write home about. So once you've done all of your testing and validation and made sure that your model is doing really well or sufficiently well, then you can publish it or tell everyone else, come, come use it. And we've done this for a few things. We've done this for you know, predicting MS spectra using hidden Markovs and artificial neural nets. And you know, we've tested it, validated it, published it, put it on a web server. And now lots of people can use this um, tool to predict mass spectra. Uh, we've done this for protein secondary structure. We validated, tested it, performed all the assessments, and then we put it out on a web server. So, you know, we've done this for lots of different uh, examples and many other people have done these, but this is what you do when you finish your predictor. You either release it on GitHub, you publish it as a web server, or you use it internally and sell it to other people and make money. Those are how uh, a lot of people in the machine learning business uh, work. So we're gonna, you know, over the next, two days show you two types of machine learning models, a decision tree and an artificial neural net. We're gonna apply them to general classification, secondary structure prediction, and gene finding. These are kind of toy problems, but they should give you a better understanding of how these work. We're gonna deep dive into the algorithms. We're gonna use Python, we're using Google Colab. And then we're gonna show you how, after climbing Everest through the hard route, we're gonna show you how you can helicopter up to Everest using Keras and scikit-learn and do the same thing and code it much more quickly um, using these uh, these other tools, and that'll be done tomorrow. 
So this is the end of the module. Um, I think we'll just make sure that everyone has been able to you know, get onto the Google Colab. These are slides that all of you received. If any of you haven't got these things, haven't been able to do or install uh, or even create a uh, Google account, then you should follow these slides or use the break that we have to, to go through this. Um, so these are all something you've got. I'm not going to go through this again. Uh, the different um, libraries that we'll be using, uh, also about the R and where to get the um, student pages, the course repository. Hopefully everyone can get those. And then because of these libraries like Scikit-Learn, Keras, TensorFlow, Azure, PyTorch, Weka, a lot of the things that are going to look pretty difficult today uh, can be done much more easily with these libraries. And we'll see how to do that tomorrow. So I, I've just tried to make sure that you have a basic understanding of machine learning, understand how you could use it, can use it for pattern finding, fitting, prediction, biomarker identification. There are many different models. It's used in many things that you use today. And it's certainly becoming much more accessible because of some of these things. And we'll learn about how that can be done tomorrow as opposed to today. Uh, we've talked about the history, the applications, uh, the data access or the ideas and how you scope your problem and frame it are, are really critical to, to making it work for you. So I've gone over time. Um, I also do want to emphasize that you know, machine learning isn't for everything. In fact, many common multivariate statistical techniques like principal component analysis, partial least squares discriminant analysis, logistic regression are all technically machine learning methods. They're very old but they work really well. And there's really nice programs. Metabolo Analyst is one where you can do biomarker identification um, pretty automatically uh, with just about any data set. Um, so you don't have to know machine learning. You don't have to know programming. You can just upload your data set. And Metabolo Analyst's biomarker model, module can do your biomarker identification using either traditional statistical methods or sort of these multivariate statistical machine learning methods. It does offer um, support vector machine models, which are you know, closer to machine learning ones. Um, but um, those are examples where you can just go to an online tool and, and get your biomarkers discovered from pretty complex data. It could be genetic data, proteomic data, metabolomic data, transcriptomic data, the metabolist handles it all, um, clinical data. Um, and, and, and determine or identify your biomarkers. So you don't need to do any coding, but uh, I think a lot of you here are here to learn a little bit more about how to do uh, just that sort of thing so you can customize your models.